Church. Uh, welcome to our evening Bible study. And uh, we shall begin by singing hymn number 121. Hymn number 121. <laughs>
This week we had our soul winning and by the grace of God we had 12 people believe on our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God for that and we encourage you to keep doing that. Let us not tire. As long as God has given us life, let us not get tired. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, next Sunday we'll be having baptism. So if you know that you're going to be baptized, please continue preparing yourself. Remember to carry your second attire on next Sunday. Sunday service will begin at 10 uh, 15 as normal as we, are, uh, we, we normally do. Uh, today is a, a Wednesday and we always have these services on Wednesday and Friday. I ask you in the name of God that uh, next uh, Friday, let us try and come early. Now when I say early, I mean normally we come at 5, but I would request you, if you have nothing that will hinder you to come on time, please just try to come at 4 or 4.30. So that we have a humble time because there are things that we want to understand even more. Amen. Amen. So please, purpose in your heart, if you can be found in the house of God on time, please do. So without much ado, uh, I want to pray for our preacher today. And I will ask you to be only going enough because you can see that uh, we have other things going out there. They might make your voice not to come out very clear. So mind that as you think the truth of God around the world. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a humble time, such a good Wednesday, for the purpose of coming here, O oh Lord, and hear your word. We want to thank you for giving us the gift of life. Thank you, Lord, for providing us our daily meal. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the cloth to put on. And now, Lord, we are here for the purpose of the spiritual meal, the word of God. We ask you to help Brother James to be guided of the Holy Spirit of God and guided in the grace of God, even as he teaches us the word of God. And we, the hearers, the listeners, we shall receive this word with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. May God bless you so much. Keep welcome, Brother James. Please turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Please turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. Today we're going to continue with the book of Jonah. Last week we were in Jonah chapter 2. The week before that, Jonah chapter 1. Today we're going to be continuing with Jonah chapter 3. 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 Jonah chapter Going through verse by verse, chapter, line by line, through Jonah chapter 3. Are you all there? Yeah. Jonah chapter 3. Okay. So, uh, before we go to uh, Jonah chapter 3, let's summarize a little bit. Jonah chapter 1, we are talking about the man Jonah. Jonah chapter 2, the man is a prayer of Jonah. He saw that how Jonah was desperate for God's help. He was asking God to help him to save him out of the world's pain. Now here in Jonah chapter 3, you're going to see Jonah in the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh. So look down at, at your Bibles at Jonah chapter 2, look at verse 10. Jonah chapter 2, look at verse 10, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the, upon the dry land. So God spoke unto the fish that was containing Jonah in his stomach, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. You see that? That's where we were last week. Let, let us continue. Look at Jonah chapter 3, look at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, So before that, he said that God's word came unto Jonah the second time. The first time he came, he came to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. And Jonah, and Jonah was disobedient to the word of the Lord. To the, to the word of the Lord. To the word of the Lord. Remember that? Now look at verse 2. Let's see if Jonah makes the same mistake. Jonah chapter 3, verse 2. Arise, go unto me about that great city and preach unto it. The preaching that I bid you. So this is God speaking unto the men. Jonah say, rise up. So Jonah is on the ground. He said, get up, get on your feet, and go to Jonah and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto the, 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 the preaching that I bid you. Now, if you are paying attention in Jonah chapter one, this is pretty much the exact same thing that, Jonah, that God told Jonah the first time, showing that God's word does not change. God does not change. Let's see that in the Bible. Look at. Go to Malachi chapter chapter three. Malachi chapter three, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter three. God's word, God's word to, to, to Jonah is the same as in Jonah chapter 1. 
And you see why I'm going in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 6. It says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So God does not change. See that? So go to go to First Peter chapter 1. And first I'll go to First Peter chapter 1. I'll read, I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 38 says, Jesus Christ is same yesterday and today and forever. And, and you, you turn to First Peter chapter 1. I'll read to you from uh, Psalms 1, 1 to 1, 1 to 101. Verse 34 it says, you turn to First Peter 1. In uh, Psalms 1 to 1, verse 38, verse 34, it says, And I said, Oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, thy years are throughout all generations. Verse 26 says, They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and their years shall have no end. So the person of God, God in, in general, does not change. But also his word doesn't change. Doesn't change. Look at, uh, are you then First Peter? Look at chapter 1, verse 25. First Peter chapter 1, verse 25, it says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word of the Lord, which by the gospel is preached unto you. So God doesn't change. That's why his word to Jonah in, in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, doesn't is it's exactly the same thing because God doesn't change. And so and look and uh, look, look go back to Jonah chapter three. Go back to Jonah chapter three. Look, look, look at verse three. Go back to Jonah chapter three. Like uh, if you have your Bibles you should keep a pen there or something. So we're going to put down the verses all over the back to Jonah three. Jonah chapter three. Look at verse three. It says, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So Jonah is obedient to the word of the Lord. You see that? So he learned from his mistake from Jonah chapter 1. So let's keep reading. Look at uh, look at verse 3. Let's, let's, let's keep going. It says, now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Now remember, Nineveh is a capital city of a nation by the name of Assyria. And it says it is an exceeding great city. Exceeding great referring to the size. It was a very big city. And says of three days journey, meaning for you to traverse the whole city from point A to point B, it will take you three days to go throughout the whole city. That's how big this city is. You see that? Let's keep reading. Look at verse four. And Jonah began to enter into the into the city a day's journey. So Jonah goes one third into the city, and when he's in the midst of the city, he starts preaching. And remember, God told him, "Preach what I bid thee." So the words that God put into Jonah's mouth, that's what he preached. Now, there's some that would have a different interpretation of uh, Jonah verse 3 and verse 4. Some would say that when he's talking about a three days' journey, it means that it, it, it would require, require you to take, it would take three days to get to the city of Nineveh. But I don't believe that. I believe when he talks about three days' journey, like look at verse 3. It says, Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. So the off day is referring to the size of the city. So it means it would take you three days to reverse the whole thing. So when, when he says that it takes three days, see, that's referring to the city, and in verse 4, he says, and Jonah began entering the city a day's journey. I Meaning he went a day's journey into the city and then started preaching. So he pretty much went to the city center and then he just started preaching. Okay? Then let's keep going. Look, look, you're still there in verse 4. Let's, let's, let's keep reading. And he cried. Uh, he referred to Jonah. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Of so, so God doesn't give us uh, everything that Jonah says. Just this, this is the only thing that was preserved of what he said. And it's pretty much a summary of what Jonah preached unto the people of Nineveh. And, he, and, and as you can see, it's, a, it's not a positive message. You see that it says, yet 40 days, in 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So he's saying, in 40 days from now, Nineveh shall cease to exist. That's what Jonah was preaching unto them. So it's a hard preaching and preaching against sin. You see that? That's why in uh, first of Micah chapter 3, Micah chapter 3, so the, 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 those words encapsulate the theme of what Jonah was, was saying. So it was a negative preaching, a negative sermon, hard preaching. So we see that that hard preaching works. Are okay, so you in Micah 3 8? I'll, I'll read to you from Isaiah 58. So Isaiah, when you turn to Micah chapter 3, verse 8, I'll read to you from Isaiah 15, 58. Verse 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, give them thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people 
their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. So preaching against sin in a, in a loud voice is a biblical command to pastors. Are you there in Micah 3? Micah 3, uh, look at verse 8. It says, Micah 3 verse 8 says, But truly I am, I, I am full of power by the Spirit of, of the Lord, and of judgment and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. So this is a format that, Jacob, that uh, Ju uh, Jonah used when preaching to the people of Nineveh. He preached unto them their sin and declared to them their transgression. Let's see, let's, let's see what happens. Go back to Jonah. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 5. Look at, go back to the book of Jonah. We'll keep reading. Look at verse 5. Let's see, let's see what the people of Nineveh did in result to uh, Jonah's hard preaching against sin. Are, you, are we all there? Okay, so Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, he says, So the people of Nineveh believed God, number one, and proclaimed a fast, number two, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. So you see the result of hard preaching. They believed God, they proclaimed the fast, and they put on sackcloth. So you say, what is sackcloth? Sackcloth is uh, a rough garment that people would put on as a form of mourning, as a form of mourning of, of humility towards God, like in the book of Esther, where Mordecai puts on sackcloth after he hears uh, what Haman wants to do to the Jews. It was a form of, it was a clothing that people would wear when they are mourning. So that's what the people of Nineveh do. They believe on God, they proclaim a fast, and they proclaim a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them and to the least of them. You see that? Let's keep reading. Look at verse 6. For four, take note of that. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and set in ashes. So the king of Nineveh was informed of the preaching of, of, of Jonah, and, the, and in result of him hearing the content of what Jonah preached, he proclaims a, a decree saying that. So he, what he does is he takes off his king's robes, he, put, he covers himself in sackcloth and he sits in ashes, just like Job did. Remember when Job was sitting in ashes? So now the, now the king is so the king is basically humbling himself before the preaching of Jonah. And, and by him doing that, the whole city gets, gets right with God. Because look at verse 6 again. What, what's the first word in, of verse 6? What's the first word? For. You see that? For means because. So because the king humbled himself before God, the people of Nineveh did the same thing. Because, because the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, if a ruler hearkens to lies, all his servants are wicked. So if a ruler hearkens to the truth, what will happen to his servants? They will be righteous, right? Because a, a king or a ruler has influence over the people of heaven. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 7. Let's keep reading. Look at, look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, and he, he is referring to the king. And he caused it to be and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. So the king and the people around him, the the, the high class and the people, proclaim a, a decree saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. Verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger and be perished not? <coughs> so the king of so the king commands all the people of Nineveh to put on sackcloth and repent as according to Jonah's preaching. Showing again that Jonah was number one a great preacher and number two hard preaching works. Amen? Okay now with now we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Jonah the book of Jonah. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18. We'll come back to uh, Jonah uh, verse 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. Turn, for now, turn to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verse 7. We're going to dig into the subject of the people of Nineveh believing on God and putting on and fasting and putting on cycles. We'll see what the, what the Bible has to say about it. We're there in Proverbs chapter 13. Look at verse 7. There is that maketh himself rich, yet have nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet have great riches. You see that? So there's something that makes you rich, but yet you have nothing. There's something that makes you poor, yet you have great riches. This is talking about the gospel, which is material gain. I remember when we were soul winning 
Uh, yes, yesterday I was with, I was talking with Brother Edmund and we're talking about rewards. Remember that? So the uh, the, the rewards in, on this earth, the, the, the works that you do for God, uh, they will make you rich in the sight of God. Yet in the sight of man, they may make you poor. But but he is specifically talking about the gospel. Now uh, we all talk about the gospel like in, like in for example in Second Corinthians chapter six verse ten. It's don't turn there. Stay in Proverbs. In Second Corinthians chapter six verse ten, it says, "As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet yet maketh yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things." So Paul is talking here about himself. Now Paul was a poor man yet he made other people rich. How did he make other people rich? To the gospel. So he gave, he preached them to the gospel when they had riches in heaven. He had, he had, as having nothing, it possessing all things. So the, uh, the man Paul had nothing but possessed all things through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in Second Corinthians chapter eight verse nine it says, "For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich." So Jesus became poor for our sakes. How did he become poor? Through his death. And through his death, he made us rich. By, so by believing on him, by believing on the gospel specifically, we become rich in his sight. But he became poor by dying on the cross. That's why, are you still there in Proverbs 13, verse 7? Look down again. There is that make himself rich, yet have nothing. So, they, so material gain or worldly possessions will make you rich. But in the end, you have nothing. Because you go to hell. Let's keep reading you. There is that make himself poor, yet have, yet, yet have great riches. So, so, so if you go back, let's, now let's apply this to the, to the book of Jonah. The people of Nineveh, remember, they were, they were sitting in ashes and they were wearing sackcloth. So outwardly, they, they might appear poor, but inwardly, they, great, they gained great riches through believing on God. Okay, so you still there, Proverbs, turn to chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 16, look at verse we're going to look at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 16, look at verse 6. It says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So, saying so, by truth and iniquity, so, so by truth and mercy, iniquity is purged. Iniquity is referring to sin. Purge means it's done away with, it's removed. So, what, what does this mean? Let's break it down. In uh, Titus chapter 3, you stay there in Proverbs. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the worship of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So God saves us by his mercy, right? Amen? So, and now with that in mind, let me read to you from John chapter 14, verse 6. It says, John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So who is the way, who is the truth? Right? Now, now look down at your Bibles again at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. So it says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. You see that? So by God's mercy and by the person of Jesus Christ, your sins are purged. You see that? That's what, that, that's what this verse is referring to. So it's just like the people, the people of Nineveh got saved by hearing the words of a spirit-filled man of God, Jonah, and believing in the Lord. And the Lord in return saved them, not according to their works, but according to his mercy through the truth Jesus Christ. See that? Okay, now go back to the book of Jonah. Go back to the book of Jonah. Look, uh, when chapter when, when chapter 3, look, look at verse 7. We read verses 7, 8, and 9. Let's go back to verse 7 and break it down. It's, it's a bit of it's a long verse. Jonah chapter 3, chapter 3, look at verse 7. It says, and he calls, he's referring to the king, the king of Nineveh, and he calls it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Saying, let neither man, no beast, herd, nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed, nor drink water. Remember in uh, the previous verse it says that they, they believed God, they proclaimed a fast and they put on sackcloth. So that second one where the proclaiming a fast, is, 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 it was done by the king. It's the king that declared, because it says, let neither herd, no man, eat anything. You see that? So the, so the king commands that neither animal or person eats anything. So this, this is the result of hard preaching. Look at verse 8. It says, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. 
So the king of Nineveh does something very interesting here. He says, don't only put sackcloth on, peop on, the, on the people of Nineveh, but on animals as well. Now if, now if you study scripture, there is no way in the Bible where it teaches that you're supposed to put sackcloth on animals. So it's unique to the book of Jonah. And the reason that the king of Nineveh does this is because he doesn't understand, he doesn't know scripture. He just got saved and he's a, pre he's a baby in Christ, what the Bible calls a novice mm -hmm. or a baby in Christ. He doesn't understand scripture. Let me, show you, let me show you an example of this. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. So reading this is, maybe you're reading this, you found it very peculiar. Why are they putting sackcloth on animals? It's very interesting. And, and so let me show you, uh, let me interest, illustrate this through 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Because the only time you ever see sackcloth on animals is, is in the book of Jonah. Are you there in 2 Kings chapter 5? Look at verse 1. The Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had, had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So this is a story about a man that is a Syrian, he was a mighty warrior, and through him God brought deliverance unto Syria, showing that God loves the unsaved. Even though he's not a Jew, God used them to bring deliverance to the people of Syria. Look at, jump down to verse 9. So now a man came up with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now why is he at the door? Of, now why is he at the house of Elisha? Because in verse 1 he says he was a leper. So he's here at the house of Elisha to be cured of his leprosy. Le lepros, le a leper is someone who suffers with leprosy.